Welcome to our next series of online lectures for macroeconomics. All right, in this particular series, we're going to be talking about money and banking. So what is money, right? Somebody said to ask you, what is money, right? Well, this might sound like a, a, a cop-out of a, of a definition, but money is what money does, right? So basically, anything could be money, right? Anything, and, and over, the, over, the, over the years, almost anything has been money, right? So something is money or can be money or is accepted as money if it performs these important functions. And the first one is called the medium of exchange. That is to say it's readily accepted in exchange for goods and services, right? So it allows us to buy goods and services. Now this is extremely important for several ideas. Number one is that if money is readily accepted in exchange for goods and services, it allows us to escape the, the, the system of barter, right? The idea of barter. That is to say if we were to barter, you need to have something that I want. I need to have something that you want. So we have to have a coincidence of wants. And this was challenging back in the day when people actually came to a market and said, "All right, you know, I I have chickens, and so how many how many chickens do you want for that cow?" Or you know, or so you know, I have eggs. Okay, well, how much hay is is worth a dozen eggs or something? All right, so you know, it was difficult because you had to have something that I wanted. You had I had something you needed. So money. It escapes the barter system, but this is actually probably more important is that it allows for specialization, right? Money allows for specialization. It allows for both human specialization and geographic specialization. And here's what I mean, right? So for instance, most people don't consume very much of the good or the service that they provide. So, you know, think about what I'm doing now. I, I'm teaching school, so I teach it. I teach at the, the collegiate level, right, teaching college. So, well, I already have a college degree. Heck, you know, I already have an, a master's degree. I, if anything, I might, you know, pursue a PhD, but I definitely don't want any more college undergraduate education, right? So I want zero of the actual service that I provide to other people. But because I get paid in dollars, I can go out and go ahead and consume the goods and services that I desire. So it allows for human beings to specialize in the area where they're, they're most efficient at producing goods and providing services. So it allows for human, human specialization. Money also allows for geographic uh, specialization when, it, when it's used as a medium of exchange. Because what happens is that you know, people in Idaho could grow oranges if they had to. And people in Florida could could grow potatoes if they absolutely positively had to, but you know it, it makes more sense geographically for Floridians to produce citrus flute fruits because they have a, a you know a, a a comparative advantage of resources are are relatively abundant and 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 very concentrated in that particular area. Likewise, in Idaho, there you know resources lend the, towards producing potatoes. So you know this allows for geographic specialization. You know why has a lot of manufacturing now gone over to China? Well, because they have an enormous labor pool, which makes their cost of labor much much lower, right? So that's so because we can tie together the you know the system with money. It allows for geographics and human specialization. So as long as money is is it performs the function of a medium exchange, we avoid the barter system, and human and geographic specialization can take place. Now the second function of money, this unit of account, like when I'm in a class, I usually uh, play this little game and say, okay, everybody think of one good and one service worth exactly one hundred dollars. So whether you're playing, you know that 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 potluck. Uh, game where everybody buys a present worth the same amount of money they bring it to the to bring it to the party and then you know they put it in a box and everybody exchanges boxes so you know say okay rattle off four or five goods or four or five services that are worth a hundred dollars well for a good you know a, a decent pair of shoes is worth a hundred dollars right um, you could say that a, you know a, a cell phone is worth one hundred dollars you could say that you know Maybe uh, a, a, a really nice um, pair of headphones for you know for your for your um, iPod would be worth one hundred dollars, right? So within reason, we say okay, the, the, all those goods are worth one hundred dollars, right? Going to the dentist and getting your teeth cleaned that might cost you a hundred dollars, right? Getting uh, your your car detailed that might cost one hundred dollars, right? Going to uh, you know the 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 
the parlor for the day and the massage and getting like the whole works done at, at, at the at the at beauty salon that might be worth one hundred dollars so notice that we can easily judge the value of goods and services if money is performing the function of a unit of account and what that does for us is that you know we can easily readily fast you know quickly perceive opportunity costs they go all right I can either go get my car repaired and detailed for $100 or I can buy those pair of shoes right so as long as money performs that unit of account function right, it will be accepted as a, 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 as a form of money and then the last one is the store value and that is to say that you know in general we don't spend all of the money we earn in the same t time period in which we earn it so we want to be reasonably certain that the dollars that we receive will will hold their value over some period of time and you know, what one year two year five years and that say okay if you know if I have four hundred and eighty dollars today that it you know roughly a month from now six months from now even a year from now I'm gonna be able to purchase roughly four hundred and eighty dollars worth of goods and services that I could when I received the money right and that's important also that the money holds its value for a decent period of time all right now money is by definition the most liquid of all assets so liquidity is the degree to which any asset can be exchanged for goods and services so let's talk about a, a, an illiquid asset or an asset that's not very liquid in today's housing market most homes are not very liquid right especially if you'd like to receive somewhere near what you paid for your home you know depending on on when you purchased it so the housing market is 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 rather slow right now when it comes to how many how many houses are being bought and sold whether it's uh you know depending on what neighborhood you're in what what state you're in what location but in general the housing market you know it's just not a very liquid market right now if you go back into the, like time in say 2003 at that point the housing market was extremely liquid you know you could list your house on Monday and have it sold by Friday heck there were people that didn't even need to list their homes they you know they called a realtor and realtors had buyers lined up already and they simply just went ahead and sold their homes right but by definition money is the most liquid of all assets so you say okay what are what other assets might be highly liquid well typically um, uh, shares of stock in a corporation are highly liquid because stocks trade on exchanges and exchanges are open you know Monday to Friday most most business days are open so you know if, if you owned say 500 shares of Microsoft and it's it's Monday you could you, know, you call your broker or you could go online and, and sell those shares have the money deposited into your account and have that money ready to you know to spend the next day so uh, something like shares in a, in a corporation are much more liquid than 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 a home okay so we have some definitions of money All right so the the federal reserve is the nation is our nation's central bank and we're going to go into detail about the federal reserve in several uh, moments here in our in, with our video lectures but these are ways for us to measure how much money is actually circulating in the economy so the first definition is the most narrow definition of money and that's coins currency and checkable deposits All right and on the list here it says you know which institutions offer check che checkable deposits uh, you know commercial banks savings and loans mutual savings banks for for simplicity for our class we'll just say checking accounts right so you know it doesn't really matter if it's a savings and loan account or a, a thrift or a, or a commercial bank right so coins currency and checkable deposits it's quite easy to see why currency is money right but as far as checkable deposits right think about it most of the time any any significant purchase of of any type takes place with a check not with cash it's for obvious reasons one is you know it's much safer to to pay with with a check All right it's it's there's a record of you know your your payments right and if you think about it nowadays right we're, we're we're writing fewer and fewer actual checks and most of these transfers of of, of um, money actually involve simply a, a computer uh, entry and in, in, in of some sort if you think about it, my life right, I get I receive my paycheck via direct deposit my mortgage is direct 
direct withdrawal, my car payments with direct withdrawal. I pay all my bills online. So, you know, we don't even write checks anymore, although they, you know, technically it's still the same idea of transfer of money from, from a checking account into another account. Right? So there's your first, your most narrow definition of money, M1. So M2 includes all of M1, right? So it's coins, currency, checkable deposits, plus some of these what we call near monies. So you have, you know, a savings account, uh, small time CD certificate deposits, and then money market mutual funds. So, you know, th this isn't a finance class. We don't think we need to get into too much detail about, you know, what is a mutual fund uh, um, and definitely what is a money market mutual fund. But you should have a basic understanding of a money market. All right, for, for when money markets were first introduced, they were alter an alternative to your typical checking account or even savings account because they offered uh, those depositors, people who deposited money into these money market accounts, a, a typically a much higher interest rate than was available on a, a, a checking account, definitely a checking account, and sometimes even a savings account. And what would happen is that there would be restrictions. In other words, you had to keep a minimum balance of say five thousand dollars in your money market account, and you could only write one or two write one or two checks against this account a month, and the checks had to be in the the denomination of greater than two hundred and fifty dollars, right? And the reason why they offered a better interest rate was because there would be a manager of the money market account, and he or she would go out and invest in small time. Uh, like T bills and T bonds and corporate bonds and such, so they would invest in all kinds of bonds of two-year duration or less, right? right. Now that almost every single bank across the country offers money markets, and by and large, you know they're they're pretty much the same exact account no matter where you have it. It's difficult to find you know even a a better interest rate at one bank or one institution other than it, than the next one. And most of the restrictions as far as the amount you need in your money market have been removed as well. But because of what's going on in the macro sense, they, they simply just don't offer the, the same interest as they did previously. So as I was saying in a previous slide, there are three types of money. And the first type of money is what we call commodity money, where the, the actual object or physical object represents or is the money. So for instance, gold coins or silver coins or you know, shark's teeth or where, uh, or elephant tusks, you know, whatever, whatever the object is, that's the actual money. And then we went from the system where we had the physical representation of money to what we call money backed by objects of value. So where all, every dollar in circulation was, it was backed up by a certain amount of, 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 of this physical commodity. And like I said earlier, we were on the gold standard for a while. All currencies today are what we call fiat money, right? Fiat money, where the, there's, you know, the money actually has value because the government says it has value, right? So that that's the way U.S. currency works. That's actually the way all global currencies work, and currencies trade around around the, the the globe. You know, the U.S. dollar versus the Canadian dollar, or the Australian dollar, or the euro, or the you know the the Japanese yen or the Chinese yuan. Right? These currencies trade all over globally. And they're all fiat currencies, right? So let's go into some more detail about what actually gives money its value, right? So, okay, what backs the money supply then if we're working with a fiat currency, right? Well, the basic idea here is that dollars have value because of the government's ability to keep the, the value of that, that paper currency, that fiat currency, stable. So, you know, how, do, how does the government keep the, the, the dollar stable or the value of a dollar stable? The first one is that the idea is that it's you know it, money has value because it's accepted we just talked about the idea of money being uh, a medium of exchange and as long as it continues to be accepted and readily accepted for goods and services so that it facilitates the exchange of of economic transactions it's going to it's going to have value and uh, there's a nice section in the textbook about the global greenback the idea that the US dollar for better or for worse is actually the most widely used currency across the globe and you know un unfortunately whether it's a legal activity or some some illegal activities right the global greenback in other words people want US dollars because it's the most stable currency on the planet earth a matter of fact when the United States invaded um, Iraq and and, and uh, took over some of Saddam Hussein's uh, palaces and they found millions of dollars in 
uh, U.S. currency hidden in the walls of, of, of these palaces. Obviously, he'd rather have that currency, which is accepted almost anywhere, than, than Iraqi currency. The second reason why money has value is because the government deems it legal tender, right? It says on, on, the, on, the, on, on every piece of paper that, uh, you know, debt, good for all debts, public and private. And if, if, if someone is owed money and they refuse to accept it, two things occur. So, you know, if you were to owe me a large sum of money and, and I didn't accept your payment, two things would happen to me. Number one is that I would lose the right to sue for non-payment. And I would also lose the right to sue uh, for, for interest owed, right? So it's, it's legal tender. The last idea over here of why money has value is, is a, an important idea as, as well as it's relatively scarce. In other words, the good old forces of supply and demand. There's a relatively short supply of money compared to the large demand for money. So in a, in a future lecture, not too far down the road, as a matter of fact, we're going to be examining the money market. We're talking about what makes up the demand for money and who controls the supply of money. Actually, the, the Federal Reserve controls the nation's supply of money. So the fact that money is relatively scarce gives it value as well. Now, how about this idea of money as debt? Well, once money has been deposited into a, a checking account, right, it's actually debt now that th those banks actually owe that money to the individual depositors or you know institutions that who, who have deposited money into that account. And you think about cash, well, how is cash debt? Cash is simply debt issued by right, the, f the Federal Reserve. And you know, think about it in these terms. If you were to get a mall gift certificate for, say, you know, $500, well, the mall is now in debt to you to provide $500 worth of goods and services. So, you know, obviously, once, once you exchange that gift certificate in for the goods and services, that debt has been repaid. That's, that's sort of the same way we can think of money as debt. Okay, so what, how, what do we know about the money and, and price level in the economy? This idea of purchasing power is an extremely important idea. If you think, okay, how many goods and services or what's the quantity of goods and services that money will, 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 will bring to me if I, if I get rid of my dear money? Because mo money really has no value unless we part with money, right? So the value of a dollar is actually, can, can be, uh, calculated by saying, okay, one over the price level. So in other words, assume you have a hundred dollars this year. Let, let's just assume the year is 2010, right? If there's a, if there's a significant amount of inflation during 2010, say from January 1st to, to December 31st, your money is going to lose some of its purchasing power. So if we had 5% inflation in one year, you would roughly be able to purchase 5% less your purchasing power would have declined by, by the amount of inflation. Now, we already covered inflation. We know that the price level of all goods and services, number one, does not move in the same direction. It's a, you know, inflation is measured by a market basket of 300 goods and services. So the chances of all 300 of those goods and services, as far as the prices of those goods and services, moving in the same direction is nearly impossible, right? But you get the idea that the value of a dollar is measured by purchasing power, and the purchasing power is determined by one over the price level. So the higher the rate of inflation, the more it erodes or takes away the purchasing power of, of your money. Right? So obviously, greater inflation means money is less acceptable. Money is less accepted. Right? And if we think about, okay, what about you know stabilizing money's purchasing power over time? Well, that's the job of, of, of monetary policy, and that's what we're going to be talking about in, in a future lecture. We're going to talk about it is the Federal Reserve's utmost call to make certain that the amount of money in circulation is relatively scarce compared with the demand for money, which would curb the level of inflation. So that's why we have a Federal Reserve Bank and our nation's central bank, which controls the nation's money supply. So intelligent monetary supply, intelligent monetary policy, will, will most times keep inflation at bay, which will keep the value of the of a dollar from eroding. So we just explained how the prices affect changes in price level affect the per, the per, the purchasing power of money. So the greater the rate of inflation, right, the more it erodes or takes away from 
the purchasing power of, of money, right? Well, what about a period of what we call hyperinflation, which is a period of out of control inflation? So the, the greatest example of this is Germany post-World War One, right? The Germans lost World War One, and they, they cost the, uh, the British and the French, obviously lots, lots of lives were lost, but there was actually significant uh, material damage to the infrastructure within France and within Britain. So, there, you know, there was, there was a significant uh, actual cost to the war as well, to, to Britain and France and, and to some other countries as well. So Britain and France were um, determined on making the Germans pay large war reparations. All right, so the Germans came up with a very simple solution for for paying back their war reparations for the, you know, the, the damages they had done to the British and the, and the French uh, infrastructure. And what they did was they simply just printed money. They pr printed money and they printed more money to the point where within, you know, this is almost almost unfathomable what, what I'm going to say here. The value of the mark, right? So before the German, before Germany was in the Euro, they used their own currency, which was called the German mark. That was the German cur currency. Within an 18-month period, right, so a year and a half, one mark was worth one one billionth of its previous value, right? So it, it, things in Germany got so bad that people were just taking wheelbarrows full of these things and, and paying ridiculous sums for, you know, loaves of bread. And, and then people were using marks to, you know, as, as kindling for their fire or you know, to, to paper their walls. So basically what happens in a period of hyperinflation is that a currency ceases to, to function as a, a store of value and, and as, a, a, as a unit of measure and therefore is no longer accepted as a medium of exchange. And what happens during that period is that people will re 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 revert back to the barter system. They'll, you know, they'll come up with something else. In 1997, in, in, in um, Russia, there was a significant currency issue where, where there was a um, financial crisis in, in, in Russia. And this actually caused people to start using vodka as money, you know, accepted as exchange for goods and services. So during a period of hyperinflation, the actual currency will lose its value and, and human beings will look to other means to exchange goods and services. All right, the last idea here, and this will be the last idea for this particular lecture, we talked about how money uh, is stabilized, that we can stabilize the purchasing power with appropriate monetary policy, that is, controlling the supply of money with the Federal Reserve, our nation's central bank, but appropriate fiscal policy is also in order. All right, if you think about what's happening right now in, in Europe, Right, Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, these countries are having what's called a sovereign debt crisis. In other words, we covered already the idea of a federal budget. Right, if, if tax revenues exactly equal government spending, that particular country will have a balanced budget. So here in the United States, if our intake of taxes exactly equals federal spending, we would have a balanced budget. Unfortunately, right, we've been running federal budget deficits where we say, all right, that occurs when government spending exceeds tax receipts for the, for the year. And, you know, for the last several years, you know, since Mr. Obama has taken office, we've had $1.3 trillion deficits for the first three years of, uh, you know, of his presidency. So, you know, it, when does this create a problem for a currency? Well, if investors around the globe start to believe that government debt is getting exceedingly high, it can definitely affect the value of the currency within that country. So if the United States continues to run record, record deficits, it could make the dollar significantly depreciate against other currencies. Right? That could also happen in Europe where they're running these sovereign debt crises. So that's what we mean by appropriate fiscal policy is necessary to keep the purchasing power of a dollar relatively stable.